Thank you for having us here, Simon. Mm. Lovely office you've got here. Oh, cheers. Thank it's you. It's a really good office. Do you actually work from here? Do you do much work from here? Yeah, about half a day, half the day, I said half the week, I'll, yeah. I'll come in here. Not half the day. Not <laughs> what it is actually half the day, actually, because I, I work late. Uh, but my hours are really weird. Yeah. Uh, so I'll come in here at, say, three, but then I'll carry on working when I go home. Mm. And like this morning, I finished probably half five, six in the morning. Just in time for the radio and breakfast show. Just in time, exactly, yeah. So perfect. Never miss listen, it. Listen to that and then a little nap, I imagine. Yeah, because then we just sleep after half an hour. I'm kidding. Uh, but they are what I call vampire hours. Yeah. And they're not good for you. No. Why do you do that? Uh, because when we make these shows, um, the pre-recorded shows, um, you know, most sensible production companies would kind of store everything up and we'd have them all yeah. nicely sitting there, not us lot we edit all the way up to the release. Right. So if a show's going on Saturday, we've still got people in the edit bay making the show because we keep changing our minds and whatever, whatever. So uh, that's what I mainly do this week. The, the shows come in at about one in the morning, and then I note them, then I send my notes to the producers. And Is it quite hard to do all of X Factor as well as your actual job and live your life? Is it just sort of when X Factor starts, is that six months out of your year where you're like, I'm, I'm busy now? Well, I had, uh, I had this conversation with my girlfriend last night and she was saying I mean this is relentless yeah. you know because she's in New York at the moment I said we sound like this the whole time um, and she was asking are we ever going to have a normal life it's not normal no but um, there are going to be times you know where you just got to accept the fact that I have to work till five six seven in the morning mm -hmm. a few days a week and that's just the way it is but yeah. interestingly Nick I kind of like that quiet time when it's just me and I've got the shows, I can concentrate, mm -hmm. and then I think about everything else we're doing. Okay, do the dogs come here? You got, I reckon you've got the best dog names going. Do you like them? Yeah, what is it, Squiddly and Piddly? Diddly. Diddly. <laughs> it could be Piddly. It's Squiddly and Diddly, yeah, it's, they're real good yeah, pet names. They are very funny actually, because they are seriously the worst behaved dogs I have ever, ever met in my life. Do they come in here, in the office? And I, I couldn't, we because, no, because they would create, they're only that big, Yeah. Um, but I bought them in, in LA, and to buy a Yorkie, because they're Yorkshire Terriers in Los Angeles, they're about three, three and a half thousand dollars. And you just can't get them. You, you have to wait seven months. Mm -hmm. And one of the girls who worked for me said, I found these two on the internet. I said, great. She said, they're $250 each, like a tenth of the price. OK, fantastic. Bring them over. And so these two little things arise. I said, I've got to keep them. And as they got older, I don't think they're Yorkshire Terriers. <laughs> <laughs> this is like Irish Wolfhounds or something. One of their ears is like five times as big as they should be. <laughs> the tail's gone really, really curly. It's like, but I kind of like them for that. Yeah. You know, it gives them more character. Yeah, I like that. I have no idea what breed my dog is. And no one knows. It's just like a mix of things. But they have got the best personalities, yeah, right? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I'm a fan, as we said, and uh, you know, millions of people are a fan of The X Factor, but also as many people as love The X Factor, hate the X Factor and these criticism and people always like, I hate that bloody cow. How do you take criticism for, for what you're doing? The funny thing is, see, I hate the programme. I never watch it. And then that moment when you did this in the show, it's like, well, if you don't watch it, how do you know what's in it? Yeah. I, I think it's <laughs> like, you know, when, when you get polled as to who you're going to vote for, you yeah. know, people say certain things, but secretly pull down, the, pull down your blinds, shut the curtains, put the blackout blinds on and quietly watch X Factor. Yeah. Um, I don't really care, to be honest with you. You know, our job is, 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 to, is to hopefully make a show which is entertaining. Uh, if you're not being talked about, you've got a problem. Yeah, I think you're right. I think even if you, uh, even if you hate it, you still like watching it. Exactly. Something. What do you think that is? Why do you think it is so engaging? Because like you said, you can talk to anyone about it. I can talk to my mum about it, a cab driver about it. What do you think it is that people love so much? Well, I think it's... Louis? Uh, you know what, I think Louis, <laughs> Louis is a big part of it, I hate to admit it. Um, I think it is because it's about normal people. Yeah. Um, because if the other show, I could call it the other show, Strictly, um, they are so competitive with us, it is beyond belief. And I get it, I'm competitive with them, but I admit it. They're like, no, 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 we're the BBC, we're not here to compete, we don't care about ratings. Go, yes, you do. You want other people to, to watch your show, not my show. Just be honest about it. But with that show, you win a tin cup. Yeah. On our show, you know, <laughs> you've, got, you've got a chance <coughs> of having a recording career. So there's more, <laughs> there's more at stake.
<laughs> we'll edit out my laughs because I'm employed. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, how dare you say that, Simon? How dare you, Simon? Because <laughs> <laughs> it does change people's lives. I mean, you've seen all these success stories. You know, we've seen, like you say, like Leona and One Direction boys have done incredibly well. What about the people that have gone on and then they've not done well? Do you ever think, oh, I feel sorry for them? Or do you think that's the nature of the beast? It's the nature of the beast. I mean, you've got to take your moment, Nick. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always think if I'm going to put you in front of, you know, however many, 8, 9, 10, 11 million people every week, you've got to really grab that opportunity, make the most of it. Um, and because before that, people didn't know who you were. Mm. <clears throat> now, you know, pretty much the whole country knows who you are. Yeah. You've, got, you've got to make use of that. And I, and I was thinking about the boys the other day because we went to see them in... Um, in California when they were doing one of their shows. Yeah. And what's extraordinary uh, was is that two miles before I got there, they shut down all these roads. And I'm, I, I'm, I would just like show my pass. Yeah, I'm with the band. You know. face. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hello. Hello. I know, but it, I, had to, I showed the official pass. So I'm, I'm now allowed to take a shortcut in. And I thought, that's the significance of this band. They've actually shut down two miles of roads. But what I was going to say was, these boys, God, they took this opportunity, yeah. Nick. I mean, it wasn't me coming up with some sort of master plan. It was like, yeah, we'll make a record, obviously, uh, and we'll do it together. But they just ran with it. Yeah. And that's what I love. I love it when that happens. Yeah. How is your relationship with One Direction now? Because obviously you put them together. Are you, like their, are you their boss? Are you their manager? Like, well, what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the role? I think they're my boss now, uh, <laughs> literally. Uh, I think, you know, you get to the point where the first album, you have to obviously kind of guide any artist yeah. into what's happening, advise them what's going to happen, um, you know, bring in the right writers, producers you think could work best with them. But we always said with the boys from day one, Nick, when, even when they're on the show, <coughs> it wasn't a question of wear this, do this, you know, it was like, we're trying to stay in the competition, let's try and find songs that are going to keep us in the competition, yeah. uh, which we did, although we didn't win. Um, then on the first album, it was putting the best possible teams together. And then once that first album was out, if I'm being honest with you, they just ran with it and they knew what they were doing. They knew who they wanted to work with, the kind of records they wanted to make. Um, you know, I have a good team here who work with them. But um, it was always, I think, their vision mm. of what they wanted to be. And they didn't want to be some horrible boy band, you know, doing awful choreography, wearing stupid outfits. They always wanted to be themselves, and, and they really haven't changed, really, from, from when I first met them. Yeah. Um, which is nice to see. Um, and, you know, you wish for that every year, obviously, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And I wanted to talk to you about this year, you've, you've lowered the, the age. How old are you now, if you can enter the X-Factor? 14? 14, yeah. Why did you do that? Well, <coughs> if you look on it, I'm sure you do, but, you know, we've all seen these clips on YouTube and Vine and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I mean, a lot of the really good kids now are 14, 15 years old. Um, and they probably know a lot more about the old than the older contestants. Um, so I think there's one girl who's made it through who's 16 this year. Um, and one of the, the guys in the, gra in the group, I think, is 14 or 15. Yeah. It, it's case by case. Yeah. You know, if they're really nervous or you've got some horrible stage mum pushing them onto the show, forget it. If you think, you know what, they deserve this opportunity and they can handle it. Give it to them. Yeah. It's quite young though, isn't it? I mean, it's quite young to be have that pressure and to go out there it. and... At 40, 50, no I mean, leave school or be in a pop band. Yeah. I would have been in a band in a shot. Yeah. Um, and that, see, that's the problem sometimes. It's like if, they, if you don't give them a shot now, I mean, it might be a lightning in a bottle moment. It may not happen again. So I kind of go, OK, well, fine, we'll give you a shot. You're up for it. Parents are up for it. Do it. Let's do it. Yeah. There was a thing in that, I don't know if you've probably heard about this, but them putting um, restrictions on music videos. So they're going to have like age ranges. So you have to, you know, be 16 to watch this one. You have to be 18 to do this one. Well, how are they going to do that? I have no idea. But they're just going to watch them, right? Surely. they'll just In fact, in. the minute you put on whatever it is up, more younger people are yeah. going to watch them. It'd be like when MTV used to ban videos. It'd immediately mean I need to see that video. Well, I remember when I was at school and we all wanted to go and see The Exorcist. Uh -huh. And we had to be 18 and we all put fake moustaches on each other. It was like <laughs> the fact that we were told, you can't see this film. It was like, we're going to see this film. All I want to see is and this I, film. I actually remember rehearsing my deep voice. Uh, I'd like one ticket, please, in the stalls <laughs> 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 to see The Exorcist with this terrible fake moustache. What did you go for? A biro? 
Yeah, I think it was Byro. Byro. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> I'm 42. <laughs> it wasn't one of those. It was one of those, but we all did it. And the guy was kind of looking at us going, okay, come in. But what I'm saying is, is that with that kind of stuff, yeah. it will encourage them to, to watch, watch it more. They, yeah. What, what do you think of those videos? Like Rihanna gets a lot of flack and Miley Cyrus gets a lot of flack. And I am not easily shockable. And I did go to the Miley Cyrus concert and I was like, I think we had 11 kids we took. And I was like, Oh, oh dear! Oh my gosh! <laughs> like, how do you feel about those like pop stars just basically getting them out? I think it's it's very difficult because you know I'm very open-minded about yeah. most things. If I'm being honest with you, Nick, um, I think there is a point. I think what Miley slightly maybe maybe misunderstands is that you know coming from Hannah Montana, you know you're going to take a lot of that young audience with you anyway. You mm. can't suddenly appeal to twenty-five-year-olds. Um, and there are still a lot of kids, and I'm sure the kids you went with who want to go and see the concert, who are probably sitting there going, what the hell is that? <laughs> they were like, what? what I think she, she probably went too crazy too quickly, yeah. I would say. But having said that, I met Miley and I liked her. Um, and look, we're all talking about her. Um, so, you know, she's, she's a smart girl. Yeah. I think she's really smart. She came on our show and I, I didn't know what to make of her because I'd never watched Hannah Montana. And I'd only just seen like the We Can't Stop video. So I was like, I don't, I don't know what to expect with yeah. her. But we all loved her. Like, she's smart. I think she's doing it a bit more tongue in cheek. Like, I think she gets it. Yeah. Like, whereas I think like Rihanna's is like more of a, it's like a sex show. Yeah. It's like really, really sex. Whereas Miley's is a bit more well, jovial, I guess. Well, interestingly, I think you've kind of got the battle of who can be the most yeah. outrageous going on at the moment. Yeah. Um, so some of these videos are like, I don't remember making videos like this 10 or 20 years ago. Um, but look, it has to be working, like I said, because the, you know, the papers are writing about them. Are you going to sell a lot more records off the back of that? I don't think so. No. I think it still comes down, Nick, you've got to make great records. Do you think you are, like, you, like I was saying, like you do feel a lot nicer this, this year? Not, not, not you are horrible, but you were mean. You were a lot more, no, next, rubbish, can't sing. Whereas this one, I feel like you've been a bit more explaining. Has that been like a conscious thing to do? Yeah, I mean, Mel in particular uh, was much harsher than me. Yeah. I mean, literally just said, get off. I mean, wasn't even pretending to think about it. Um, <clears throat> maybe I got a bit more mellow. Um, Look, there's no. I, I never thought, Nick, to be honest with you, it's, it's necessary to be nasty for the sake of being nasty. I think in the early stages when we made these shows, I mean, people weren't used to anyone saying to someone, you're not very good. Because just people used to go on there and just lie, you know, and pretend they loved everybody. It's like, well, what's the point? When someone who's 17 comes on and they can't sing a note in tune, I would take a couple of singing lessons and you get a recording contract. I mean, you're lying. Mm. Um, and I have to say to them, it's time for a different career, guys. I feel like it's tough when, they, uh, when they've been on and they've, like, the people in their lives must have been like, you're really good at singing, Simon, you should definitely go on. And they're like, my mum thinks I'm good. And then they go, and it's awful. But mums always do, Nick. Mine doesn't. Uh, she doesn't. Oh no way! Oh, okay, well she's you... real talk. She's like you. Okay, well you you've got a rare mum. She's uh, real real talk. Most of them are always uh, the parents. You know they come in a lot. Yeah. You know what are you thinking? My child's a genius, and it's like well then you're tone deaf. Yeah. Your child can't sing, and that's <laughs> what I'm trying to. I'm trying to help your help your son or daughter. Yeah. Um, so you know, <clears throat> I, I, what we try and do uh, is is you know once you start filming. Forget the cameras are there. What would you be doing in real life? As I said, it is more funny than tragic because uh, that's just the nature of the music business, full stop. Um, and I like to kind of show that side of it. Yeah. What's your mum like? Is she, is she like a, a showy mum? Is she a proud mum? She, does she tell you off? Everything. All of those. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, she comes from a kind of a show business background. She was a dancer. Right. Um, and, you know, she, she, I mean, once when she got on a bit now, she was very flamboyant. Um, and still loves to tell me off. Mm. Like the worst thing she can say to me if I've got my friends around, and there's no answer back to this, is when she says, Simon, stop showing off. I hate that. And it's like, I hate you for saying that because I don't know what to say. You know, and you just put your head that. down. And it happened to me once when I was 15 and I brought this girl around and for Sunday lunch or whatever, and I, and I was showing off. And my mum said, Simon, stop showing off. <laughs> and, I'm, and I literally couldn't think of a reply. And I hated her so much. 
said nearly, and it stuck with me for all these years. It's a re it really gets you, that's like right in the gut. So going back, like how did it all begin? Because now you've got your record label, you've got Psycho Entertainment, X Factors on the telly. How did it all begin? How did your career begin? What was, when you were younger, when you were a teenager, what was your career path like? It was, obviously this show wasn't around then. So what was the aim and the vision when you were younger? Well, I didn't really have one, to be honest with you, uh, Nick. I mean, I, I was somebody who wasn't very good at school because I used to get bored. Right. Uh, and I used to get this feeling in my stomach at seven o'clock on a Sunday evening where there was a certain religious program that used to come on. It was sort of like Songs of Praise, yeah. but it wasn't. And at that point, when it came on, my mum would say, right, get yourself ready for school tomorrow. And it was, it was like being punched in my stomach. And I'm thinking, right, what illness can I now come up with in the next 12 hours to get out of tomorrow? And what I used to do was, uh, on a Monday morning, I'd get a hot cup of tea and I'd put it against my head like this. And then I'd say, Mom, Dad, I don't think I'm feeling too good. And they'd come in and I'm like, now I've got a fever of 120. And you smell of tea. <laughs> yeah, and you smell <laughs> really of tea. And my dad would say, you know what, Judy? He doesn't look very well. And my mum would have her arms crossed. She knew exactly what I was doing. She went, well, then you can stay in bed all day. And then an hour later, I'm out. <laughs> I would forget, just, yeah. I just didn't like school. Mm -hmm. uh, I was bored. Um, so I wanted to do something that interested me. I thought either films, music, or TV, either that would be a fun job to do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, through, I think my first job was a runner on, the, on, on, a, on a film set, uh, which I was paid about 20 quid a week, and, but loved it. I mean, mm -hmm. just literally running around for everyone. Yeah. And then I got a job in the post room at EMI Music Publishing. Um, and from that point on, I just, you know, found a couple of opportunities, left EMI, started my own label, which was a very painful process. And you kind of teach yourself. Yeah. Was there any time when you were like, I'm, I'm going to have to sack this record label business off and I'm going to have to go and get a proper job? I worked as an estate agent uh, for <clears throat> six months in Mayfair in London, and I swear they were the snottiest people I've ever met in my life. I mean, they were just grotesque. I hated every single person in there. They were vile to me. Uh, I couldn't get out of there quick enough, and that's when I got my job in the post room. And I tell you what, I had so much more fun, you know, running around Soho with the mail than I was working for this bunch of, well, I won't say the word, uh, in, in, in uh, wherever it was. Uh -huh. um, uh, there are always points uh, where you think, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do this, or maybe I'm not very good at it because you put some records out and they're not charting, and it's frustrating, but you've got to be patient. Yeah. And, and it is one of those things, eventually you kind of learn, you use your head, you meet smart people along the way, Nick, and I was lucky I met a lot of smart people, but I recognised them as smart people. With Pete, for instance, I followed him around like a dog mm -hmm. for like two or three years. I used to sit in his studio at the back and watched how records were made, and how they wrote songs, and, and it was a good experience. Yeah. Who do you think, or what do you think makes the, the perfect pop star? Is there someone out there that you think is hands down the number one performer? Well, without question, Beyonce. Uh, and you know, I don't know her well. I've met her on a few occasions. Um, but what I do know about her is, is that this girl is 100% aware of what's happening at any time around the world. She knows who's writing the best material. She knows when a great song comes available. Um, uh, and what she's achieved is because she, she's a killer in the nicest sense of the word. Mm -hmm. She wants to win. She always wants to be the biggest artist in the world, who's become the biggest artist in the world, and never, ever, ever stops rehearsing or trying to get better. When you've got an artist like that, it's a dream. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also like people like Adele, who know when to take time off and do things under her own uh, uh, way of doing things, which is, if I want to take two years, I'll take two years off. And um, before you go, um, what do you think has been, what do you think has been like your career highlight? What's been like the best moment of being Simon Cowell? Uh, luckily, I've had a few. Um, I think probably the day I literally did pinch myself was One Direction at Wembley Stadium. Right. I mean, you know, doing my job, I mean, you obviously dream that one day you could be sitting there with an artist, you, you know, you work with. And on the day it happened, it was, I still get a kind of a goosebump 
feeling when I think about that moment, you know, and I literally did pinch myself. Yeah. I mean, that's an insane moment to yeah. go from, come on, Zane, dance, <laughs> yeah. to, wow, you're like huge stars on this stage now. Yeah, it yeah. was really, really special. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and that will stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, um, and, you know, that's why, you, you know, you, you do this job, you know, for moments like that. It was amazing. Yeah. How would you like to be remembered, Simon Cowell? Uh, for not showing off. <laughs> for not showing off, that's <laughs> never going to happen. <laughs> Maybe just for showing off. <laughs> just for Maybe showing off. Maybe that's easier. Yeah. Simon Cowell was a show off. Yeah. I'll live with that. That's a good one. Yeah. Well, thank you, Simon. That was really good. Oh, good. Good to talk to you. Likewise. Thanks, Thanks very much, Simon. Indeed.